every single way to our relationship with God, our relationship with Christ, and to the church. After we look at some of these verses and unpack them a little bit, we are going to have a time of commitment. This morning, we're going to get up and move around. After we look at these verses and we look at the call that God has put on our lives, I'm going to ask you guys to, to take a few moments and to consider this commitment seriously uh, through prayer and, and reflection. And then when you're serious about this commitment, to come down and sign a document showing that you commit to these things. And we're going to go through all of this stuff. Um, but the exact nature of this document, we'll talk about. Uh, there are nine statements on there, nine statements of commitment. Uh, but that's not all. There's also tables set up in the annex that have uh, papers on them to sign up for various events, missions, ministry, and donations. So don't get too comfortable this morning. I like you know I, I know how uh, when you know once communion's over and the kids get done, everybody kind of settles in a little bit. They're like Richie's going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes. I can kind of chill out and get comfortable. Uh, don't get too comfortable. Um, you're not going to be there uh, too terribly long. But let's be honest here. Uh, comfort is the enemy of the church. Comfort is the enemy of the kingdom of God. Because what happens is God's people come in and they get all comfortable. I'm not talking about physical comfort. I'm talking about spiritual comfort. We come in, we get comfortable, we get complacent, we get apathetic, we get to where we don't care and we don't want to get up and get anything done. We get lazy in our kingdom work. Last week we looked at the early church and we looked at everything that the early church did and everything that they believed and all of their hearts and all of their attitude. The early church was anything but comfortable. They were anything but lazy. They were fully committed to God and fully committed to the cause of the gospel in everything that they did. Look at the main verse we looked at last week. This is from Acts 2.42. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Notice that word there says they were devoted. It didn't say they were kind of uh, hanging out with the apostles every now and then when they had time. It didn't say that they came in and sat on a pew and listened to the apostles and dozed off on and off while, while the apostles were teaching. It said, no, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were hanging on every word, soaking up everything that they taught them. They were devoted to the fellowship of being together, of growing in their faith with each other. They were devoted uh, to prayer. They were devoted on and on. There was nothing about the early church that was part-time. There was nothing about the other church that was flippant. There was nothing about the other church other than being all in. Let's be real for a minute. If we could somehow um, develop and um, design a time machine and go back to the early church, go back to, say, uh, 20 or uh, go back to 40 A.D. and pluck someone out of the early church and bring them here and invite them to this church on a Sunday morning. Imagine what they would be like. Imagine what they would think. First of all, they would think it was awesome that we had the opportunity to meet in a building uh, with awesome pews and, you know, and, and a heating system. They would be thrilled that we have the freedom to come and worship outright. Uh, but that's where, that's where their um, being happy would end. They would wonder why we were only here for an hour. They would wonder uh, why we were only together here for this one hour. They would wonder why we would go out into the community and go to ball games and go to get gas or go to the diner and not be preaching and trying to reach the lost. They would wonder why the gospel of Christ has such a small impact on our lives. They would wonder why we were so lazy and complacent at times. They would wonder what in the world happened. They would say that we had this great freedom to worship and talk about the gospel, but we're so wishy-washy with our commitment that we keep it to ourselves. Our commitment to the gospel is lacking. Not just this church, the church as a whole, the American church um, in this day and age. Our commitment to God is lacking. Our commitment to the church is lacking. Our commitment to the kingdom of God and the cause of the gospel is lacking. Look what Paul tells the church in Philippi in Philippians 3. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And on some point you think differently. The true God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join together in following in my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live, who live as we do. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power enables us to bring everything under his control, who will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 
Paul tells the church that he is pressing on towards the goal. Paul doesn't tell the church that he's just chilling out in his faith. Paul doesn't tell the church that because Jesus went to the cross and went to the grave and came out of the grave that now he can just chill out and not do anything. No, Paul says, I am pressing on towards the goal. I am doing everything that I can for the kingdom of God here on this earth. And he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He says, take this example. Take this model of what I'm showing you right now and do that in your life as well. He's calling on the church to grow, to spread the good news until the return of Christ. And church, we are called to do the same thing. The Christian life calls for full commitment all the way. Look what Jesus says in Luke 9. It says that he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For who wants to save their life will lose it, but who loses their life for me will save it. What good is it? For someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very soul. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes to glory in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So Jesus makes it abundantly clear to his disciples how we are supposed to follow him. The only way, the only way, not just one of the ways, the only way. To fully live the Christian life is to lay down our wants and lay down our desires and our wills and our lives and our hope for our future and pick up what Christ is giving us. Following Christ is not a part-time job. Later in the chapter, three separate people come to Jesus and they say that they're going to follow him. Look at these exchanges. It says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you where you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the, bed, the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service into the kingdom of God. So Jesus lets these three people know exactly what it takes to follow him. Exactly what it takes. This first dude comes up to him. He's like, look, I'm going to follow you. We're good. And Jesus is like, dude, we don't even have a house. We don't have a bed. We don't have a pillow. We don't have a blanket. We have nothing. So in order for you to follow me, you're going to have to give up everything you have and come and have nothing with me. The second guy, uh, Jesus says, follow me. He says, let me go bury my father. And Jesus gives him the most awesome response ever. He says, let the dead bury your own dead. And come on, follow me. Now, this sounds really heartless from Jesus. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this dude's dad wasn't even dead yet. This was a famous saying uh, that the Hebrews said. Basically, this guy's like, look, let me wait for my dad to die. And then once he dies, I will get my inheritance and get all this money. And then I'll come and follow you. We're not talking about his dad's already dead, the funeral's tomorrow, and everything's good. No, this is decades and decades of him waiting to follow Jesus. And then finally, the last guy's like, hey, let me go say goodbye to my family first, and then I'll follow you. This would have been like a two or three week long party, and Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not good enough. That's not good enough. You need to leave everything behind and come and follow me. Following Jesus is all in, all the time, full on committal. There's no way around it. Look what Paul tells Timothy. He says, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but all those who have longed for his appearance. Paul's, Paul's talking to Timothy here. And Timothy was a young man uh, that in Acts 9 he picks up and, and disciples through the whole way. Uh, and he's telling him, he says, look, do the duties that God has placed on you. Do these ministry duties that God has called you to do. And then Paul says, look, I am being poured out. He says, my life is almost over. When Paul wrote this, he was in a Roman prison. He was in a dungeon prison knowing that within the next few weeks he would be dead. He knew that he was going to be killed for his faith. And he is okay with that. He's run this race. He was fully committed. And he's going all the way to the end to receive his reward. 
Paul's example is one that we should always follow. We are here on this earth to run this race that Paul ran. Each and every one of us, not just Paul, an apostle, not just me as a preacher, or Ray and Jim as elders or any deacons, each and every one of us are put on this earth to run this race. As soon as we stop and we said, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you, I am making you my Lord and Savior, we come up and we commit to him and we give him our entire life. It is our goal, it is our mission, it is our calling, it is our duty in life. Christ died for us. Christ died so that we could be redeemed to him, even though we were sinful, and all he calls for us is to be fully committed to him. Like I said earlier, this is a Commitment Sunday. And we've looked at just a few of these examples of biblical commitment. And we could stand up here, I could stand up here for just hours, and we could read through the book of Acts and read through all of Paul's letters and Peter's letters and, and, and show that, that coming to Christ and being a Christian is not a part-time thing, that you have to be fully committed. So we're going to take these, these, these biblical thoughts and these theories of commitment uh, and make them real and actual. You know, a lot of the times what we do is we'll sit and read, uh, you know, scripture or we'll hear a sermon on scripture and we're thinking, that's, oh, that's great, that's great. And we kind of keep it over here in like a theoretical uh, world. We kind of keep it over here and we don't really apply it to our lives. But this morning we have to take this and apply it to our lives. We have to actually come to the point where we are ready to commit. Where we are ready to stop and say, I am all in. Uh, if you got a bulletin this morning, uh, there's a piece of cardstock in there uh, with this pledge of commitment that I talked about. And, and if not, I've got a whole bunch up here um, that, that you want to have. And there's also a piece of paper uh, to my left up here. A big, big, long uh, piece of paper. And this basically is just a pledge of commitment. Uh, and the guys at Staples did a good job printing this off for me. But this basically is just, there's nine points on here. Simple things, simple things fully backed up by scripture. And I'm going to go through them one by one here in a minute. Uh, but once we get done, then you'll just come up um, and sign your name to that, committing to these things. The first thing that's on there, um, the very, very first thing, number one, I commit to being a church. That sounds real dumb, doesn't it? That sounds like a no, a no duh thing. But then at the same time, it's kind of like, wait a minute, you know, I, I, you know what, what if I can't, can't be a church? Listen, you cannot grow if you are not a church. You cannot grow if you are not here. You cannot grow in your spiritual maturity uh, if you are not here corporately worshiping with your brothers and sisters. You cannot grow if you are not here listening to the word of God. You cannot grow if you are not together in fellowship one another with iron sharpening iron. Now, obviously, uh, there's a small chance that anyone's going to have perfect Sunday attendance. Obviously, things come up. You know, you're going to get sick. You're going to have stuff going on. There are going to be Sundays that you're going to miss. But you need to commit to say, yes, I will be at church. You've got, we have to change our attitude from, are we going to church today, to we are going to church today. Sunday morning, there should not be a conversation that says, well, should we go to church today? No, it should be absolutely we are going to church every single week unless something happens to come up. Number two, I commit to giving to Board of Church of Christ in accordance with Scripture. That's another scary one right there. Talk about giving right out of there. Giving is a huge spiritual discipline. If I've said it once up here, I've said it a thousand times. God does not need your money. Born Church of Christ does not need your money. God will take care of this church. So don't think I'll stand up here begging for money and it has nothing to do with that. But you need to give your money. You need to make a point in your life where you stop and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you to get me through this life. I'm going to give you 10% of my income knowing that 90% that you have is going to be better than 100% that I have. You need to give so that you can set your support behind this church, behind this kingdom. Set up the online giving. Uh, you know, this is a day and age where we pay all of our bills online. Have it automatically come out. There's nothing unspiritual about online giving. You are making a commitment to God to give a certain percentage to him. Just because it comes out automatically doesn't mean anything different. Giving is a huge step in growth and it has to be a part of our commitment to God. Number three, I will commit to, I commit to growing in my spiritual maturity. This is a huge one. This is a huge one. Each and every one of us need to make a commitment every single day to grow in our spiritual maturity. 
If you are not growing, you are dying, plain and simple. Plain and simple. If you are not growing, you are dying. If you're not growing in your spiritual maturity, you are becoming stagnant and rotting away. And I'm going to tell you one thing. You are the only person who is responsible for your spiritual maturity. You are the only person who is responsible for your spiritual maturity. Obviously, God's going to grow you. Obviously, the Holy Spirit's the one that's going to grow you. But you have to let him do that. I can stand up here and preach all day. I could come to your house and go through Bible studies. And I could text you every half hour on the half hour. But if you don't want to grow, you are not going to grow. Only you can make yourself grow through the power of the Holy Spirit if you commit to it. Number four, I commit to taking the love of God and the good news of his grace outside these four walls. Spreading the good news and the grace of God is the duty and the responsibility of every single person who claims Christ as their Lord and Savior. We have the greatest news ever. We are broken, sin-filled people who deserved eternal death, yet God loved us so much with that reckless love that he sent his son to this earth to die because he loved us that much. It is the greatest news ever, and we cannot keep it to ourselves. Number five, I commit to living a holy life, living in a manner worthy of God. God has saved us through his grace and through his blood. We cannot save ourselves, but in response to the great grace of God, he has called us to live a certain way. He has called us to live holy, to live set apart from the world, turning away from the sinful nature that our flesh pulls us to. Number six, uh, I commit to being an active member of Borden Church of Christ through service, encouragement, and being a champion of her cause. Being an active member of church is crucial to the growth of the individual. It's crucial to the growth of the church. Just coming to church and spending one hour a week sitting in a pew is not enough. It is not enough. We are called to service. We are called to encouragement. We are called to champion everything that we do here in this church. On top of this document that's up here that you guys will come through and sign, uh, once you get done signing, you'll head into the annex, and there's two tables set up uh, with sign-up sheets on it for several different ministries that we've got going on here. Places for you to sign up in the outreach ministry, in the children's ministry, the teen ministry, greeting and follow-up, facilities, car ministry, prayer team, uh, a small group sign-up, and everything. There's even one back there that's blank. If you feel God leading you to serve this church in a certain way, uh, in a certain capacity where God has given you a talent for that, and it's not currently going on in this church, write it on that paper, and we'll get together, and if it works, we'll get it going. Being an active member and a part of this uh, church will, will make you thrive in your faith and will make this church thrive as well. Number seven, I commit to giving glory to God in all that I do. This was pretty self-explanatory here. This is really self-explanatory. Uh, Paul tells the church in Colossae, he says, look, whatever you do, whether you do it in word and deed, do it for the glory of God. The will of God for all mankind is for us to make God famous through our lives. Number eight, I commit to seek and honor God, be faithful to his church, obey his word, and strive to do his will in all things. This is a broad statement that basically just covers everything that we may have left out on the first session. A broad statement that covers all aspects of life. Honor God, be faithful to the church, obey scripture, and do God's will. If we take this sentence, if we take this sentence right here and we, we put it in our lives and we, we live this out every single day, we will fulfill the word of God, we will grow, we will further his kingdom. And then finally, number nine, uh, I commit to being an all-in, full-time follower of Jesus Christ. This last one here is absolutely the most important. Because if you hit number nine, you're going to hit the first eight, okay? We are committing to being all-in, committing to be a full-time follower of Jesus Christ, committing to put off everything else that we want, all of our wills, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, everything, and, and putting them down, saying, God, I'm going to pick up what you have for me, and I'm going to follow you. Knowing that what you have for me is better than anything I could have for myself. We are expelling ourselves from the throne of our hearts and putting Christ on that throne. These nine statements, these are statements of, of faith. These are statements of commitment. They're simple. There's really nothing 
difficult about these nine statements. They're all biblically backed up. If you look in your bulletin, uh, there's a verse that goes with each and every one of those. So what I want you to do here in a minute, we're going to, the band's going to come back up and we're going to play two songs. And this, this pledge of commitment is going to be up here. What I want you to do is I don't want you just to rush up here and sign it and not think about it. I don't want you to just come right up because that's what you're quote unquote supposed to do. I don't want you to do that at all. When we start playing the music, I want you to take a few moments. Take a few moments and just sit there. Just sit there for a few moments and spend some time with God. And talk to him about these commitments. Talk to them about these nine statements. Because the absolute last thing that I want you to do, the absolute last thing God wants you to do is just come up and sign this and not mean it. God doesn't want you to just come up and sign and say, yeah, I'm going to do that, and then not do it. He wants you to be fully committed to him, fully committed to the kingdom, fully committed to the gospel, and fully committed to this church. Now, obviously, if you're visiting with us today and you don't want to come up and make this commitment, hey, that's totally cool. We're going to be singing two songs. Feel free to worship with all you've got while you're at it. But if you're a part of this church, it's time for the rubber to hit the road. It's time to draw the line in the sand. It's time to get up out of here and stand up and say, yeah, I'm all in. And when you're ready to make that commitment, come down and sign this sheet and then head into the annex and sign up for a few other things that are back there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you have given to us. And God, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to commit to you. And God, you committed to us by sending your son to die on the cross. There's nothing about your love that's part-time. There's nothing about your grace that's part-time. <clears throat> There's nothing about your love that is apathetic. You loved us so much as you sent your son to die for us. And you called us to a full-time, all-in commitment to you. And God, forgive us. Forgive us for the times in our lives when we didn't give that to you. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come in right now and convict each and every one of us and show us where we need to be committed to you. And God, I pray that as we look back on this day, we can see that this won't just be another Sunday, but will be a day where we all stood up. And because of that, the kingdom of God here in this community is further. We love you and we're yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.